Hello and welcome to this presentation of Narratives of Exploration. My name is Thomas Fischer, and in the following I will present to you a juxtaposition of two attitudes towards failure. This presentation is based on a recent article with the same title. The article goes beyond the scope of this video and you can obtain it from these URLs or by sending me an email. The two attitudes towards failure and their associated narratives of exploration are emblematized by the phrase failure is not an option, attributed to NASA flight director Gene Kranz, and the phrase try again, fail again, fail better, appropriated from Samuel Beckett by design cybernetician Ranulph Glanville. The two attitudes are closely related to two eras of cybernetics. The first order technical control cybernetics of the mid 20th century and the more recent second order cybernetics which is now increasingly applied to the design process. Cybernetics distinguishes systems exhibiting positive feedback which escalates deviations from initial conditions and control systems based on negative feedback which minimizes deviations from guiding references. Negative feedback allows systems to self-regulate. This can be used to give machines a degree of autonomy such that they can, for example, seek defined goals along plotted paths in physical space. In the early 20th century, US rocket scientist Robert Goddard fitted his rockets with negative feedback systems to guide them to maximum altitudes along near vertical paths. His rockets used gyroscopes to sense their spatial orientation and counteracted inclinations away from the vertical with negative feedback by deflecting the thrust of the rocket motor to reduce attitudinal error. British cybernetician W. Ross Ashby later described the principle at play here with his law of requisite variety. The rocket, shown here in top view, may deviate from the vertical around two axes, say north-south and west-east. Therefore, a gyroscope used to sense these deviations needs to be suitable to detect attitudinal changes around two axes. Ashby's law of requisite variety states accordingly that effective control requires the number of states in the controller to be equal or greater than the number of states in the controlled. While Goddard's work did not find much interest in the US, engineers in Nazi Germany applied his findings in self-guided weapons such as the A4 rocket. Following the surrender of Germany in 1945, the occupying American and Soviet forces each captured a part of the German rocket program. With the help of these resources, both countries developed rocket programs of their own. Based on technological advances of World War II, the post-war period in the US saw confidence in technology and rational professionalism rise to new levels. More than previous wars, World War II was won by planners, analysts and technologists working at desks and drafting tables. Engineers had automated weapons, operations researchers had defeated submarines in the Atlantic and cryptanalysts had broken Axis communications. Following their success, the post-war years developed what was later described as a cult of the expert. At the same time, the US and the Soviet Union engaged in a conflict over their opposed ideologies. Missile guidance and propulsion systems were now sufficiently advanced to allow the global delivery of nuclear warheads. The resulting Cold War arms race soon became a vicious positive feedback loop that assured mutual and planetary destruction. The US's technological confidence found expression throughout everyday life, for example in rocket-style tail fins on cars. The Soviet Union's successful launch of the first Earth satellite Sputnik in 1957 was a shock to the US and to its technological confidence and soon after Sputnik, the US automotive industry abandoned rocket-style tail fins. The country's search for ways to assert its perceived ideological superiority 
was a propaganda challenge as much as it was a scientific and technological challenge, and successful developments were broadcast using the morale-boosting newsreel style that had been refined during the war. The basic narrative was that the US, deploying the rational teamwork of experts, was prepared to dominate and conquer whatever was unknown, unpredictable or threatening. Once the US succeeded at launching its first satellite named Explorer 1 into orbit in 1958, a US Army newsreel announced this achievement as follows. At 10.48 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 31st, 1958, the attention of the American people was focused on Cape Canaveral, Florida, as a giant rocket was catapulted toward outer space. Few events in American history have been so awaited, prayed for, worked for, as the Army's successful launching of Explorer 1. Far across the country at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a sprawling 80-acre research and development complex in Pasadena, California, scientists and engineers were racing toward the same deadline. 90 days to put a satellite into orbit. Their job, furnish the high-speed upper stages to take over after the first stage powered the satellite to the prescribed distance from the Earth. Despite this portrayal of a mission that went as planned, Explorer 1 had accidentally entered an unintended elliptical orbit during which it veered away from Earth much further than intended. Its radiation readings indicated a highly unlikely total absence of radiation once it entered the remote parts of its orbit. It turned out that Explorer 1 had entered an area with radiation so unexpectedly high that it had jammed the sensor. This discovery was made serendipitously in a region of space the satellite was not intended to enter, using a sensor designed to detect significantly lower readings. When asked to describe the satellite's orbit, NASA's mission planners had this to say. How does this altitude compare with the Sputniks? Uh, this is um, somewhat greater than the uh, altitude of either Sputnik 1 or Sputnik 2. 23 days after the Soviet Union sent the first human into orbit, US astronaut Alan Shepard became the second human in space. Before his flight, he made this statement. I have really developed a feeling of confidence. A confidence in the people with whom I work. A confidence in the systems with which I am dealing and will have to deal in flight. And of course, a confidence in myself. After Shepard was suited up and harnessed into his capsule at 5.15 a.m., weather and hardware issues resulted in his launch being delayed until shortly before 10 a.m. By that time, his breakfast coffee and orange juice had demanded action which, for the lack of better foresight and heroic rhetoric notwithstanding, he had to relieve in his spacesuit just before becoming the first U.S. astronaut in space. Among the systems with which he was dealing, the human metabolism was overlooked. Following Shepard's successful flight, US President John F. Kennedy committed his country to the goal of going to the moon. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Compelled by this declaration of a finishing line for the space race, the Soviet Union accepted the challenge and this new goal directed research and development efforts towards a unified goal. It bought the US time, helped change the nature of the space race in favor of US strengths, and ultimately led the US to a victory over the rival Soviet Union by landing 12 American men on the moon and returning them to Earth. Earlier, when Gus Grissom, the second American in space, splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean, the explosive opening mechanism of his capsule's outward opening hatch triggered prematurely. The capsule took on water and the helicopter crews sent to recover it failed to do so. They barely managed to rescue Grissom from drowning. Following this incident, a review resulted in a new hatch design with both outward and inward opening elements for subsequent capsules. This redesign, seemingly so appropriate at the time, contributed to three accidental deaths, including Grissom's, just a few years later. 
Along with fellow astronauts Edward H. White and Roger Chaffee, Grissom was assigned to fly Apollo 1 in 1967. To save time, training and testing procedures were combined. The astronauts boarded the capsule to simulate launch procedures while the cabin's gas seals were being tested at the same time with pure oxygen at an increased interior pressure. Under these conditions, a spark in the capsule's wiring caused a fire. The heightened interior pressure, increased further by the rising temperatures, pressed against the inward opening element of the hatch, making it impossible to open quickly, and all three astronauts perished in the fire. What appeared to be a prudent design decision earlier now proved to be fatal. Yet the Apollo 1 fire prompted a further review and procedural changes that were later described as having been instrumental in getting to the moon at all. On its way to the moon, the Apollo 13 mission suffered an oxygen tank explosion which decimated the command and service module's oxygen as well as its electric power supplies, prompting this well-known radio transmission. To get the craft back to Earth while maintaining survivable conditions for the astronauts, the command and service module and the attached lunar lander had to continue their trajectory to the moon and use the moon's gravitational pull to slingshot them back towards the Earth, with the lunar lander being used as a lifeboat for most of the journey. The lunar lander, supplied with consumables to support two men for one and a half days, now had to support three men for four days. To protect the crew from poisoning during that time, exhaled carbon dioxide had to be removed from the air inside the lunar lander using filter cartridges of which there were too few. The damaged and temporarily abandoned command and service module also had a supply of filter cartridges. They were made by different contractors, however. The command and service module used box-shaped filters, while the lunar lander used a cylindrical type. The two systems were mechanically incompatible. Ground staff improvised a procedure for fashioning an adapter out of materials available on board. The procedure was radioed to the crew, carried out and worked as had been hoped. The crew was saved and the mission was later described not only as NASA's successful failure, but also as the organization's finest hour. The heroic rhetoric of the cult of the expert attributes mission success to rational, goal-directed teamwork, meticulous testing and refinement procedures, negative feedback and controlled system states. On occasion, however, it acknowledges that there is creativity involved, as in this passage from the above-mentioned U.S. Army newsreel. Long before a countdown starts at a launching pad, precise miniature replicas of the individual sections are made and subjected to numerous tests. And even the model work comes after a countless number of hours at the drafting table. Each new experiment, each test means more knowledge, which may mean a change of design. There are often no precedents. It is creative work by creative men and women. But the heroic rhetoric of First Order Cybernetics control systems does not have a narrative to describe creative exploration. It cannot explain where new concepts and ideas come from and how the ability to produce them may be cultivated. This is where Second Order Cybernetics takes the human observer into account and identifies interaction loops characterized by both positive and negative feedback between the creative self and something or someone other, such as a pen and sketching paper, models, interactive technology or other human beings. These loops are called design conversations. Design conversations generate novelty because the possible states and concepts on the two sides of the loop are not the same. They do not fulfill requisite variety and are, so to speak, out of control. Differences in understanding, misunderstandings, serendipity, accidents, error and failure offer inspiration and invite to find more options. Novelty generation thus depends on the design conversant's willingness to quote-unquote listen and to accommodate the unexpected. 
innovative design is therefore less a matter of a rationally deterministic goal orientation and more one of open-minded reflective hindsight in open-ended processes. NASA's successful landings on the moon depended on both failure-adverse deterministic control and creative insight in the wake of endemic failure to control, to understand and to predict. On various occasions, failure prompted the exploration of new options that gave rise to the spontaneous advances in the design development of equipment and protocols that enabled NASA astronauts to land on the moon and return to the Earth. Nonetheless, the dominance of deterministic and goal-oriented control narratives prevails in strategies and methodologies of various fields. We are slow to acknowledge the second-order cybernetic narratives that account for the creative process. This slowness appears to be due, in part, to a failure to retrospectively attribute accomplishments of the era of first-order cybernetics to ways of acting described only by second-order cybernetics. Thank you for watching. I'm looking forward to our discussion.